Thank you very much. Thank Vin. you very much. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, as Vin said, I'm, I'm, I'm Graham. I've been, I've been coming to uh, GPD since 1997. <laughs> and uh, so it's yeah, marvellous still to be here. Thank you very much. Um, Pete, and, and, I've, and I've worked in the, in, with Glass for about, about 30 years, uh, with Pilkington originally, and then for the last uh, 25 years nearly, uh, with, with Arup in facade engineering and, and more recently in, in materials. And uh, Peter is a, one of our most senior engineers and uh, has also has a hu huge experience with structural glass. Over oh, 15 years, oh, that's fine, yeah. yeah. And um, what we'd like to talk, talk about this afternoon is um, using, using glass walls to support, to support roofs. And it kind of starts with the modernist uh, Miesian idea, a floating roof, a space under, underneath which is open, it gives people connection with the landscape. The roof just gives you protection, the wall should be as invisible as possible. Um, you know, that's, a good, that's, a, that's a been the kind of the, the architectural model, if you like, for, for the 20th century. Um, the wall, the, the, the walls as invisible as possible, minimal structure, trying to pretend it wasn't there. And the glass, as we've, as we've all heard about, uh, glass has become more and more, more structural and, we, and has been used in that role. So we're going to talk about gravity and stability elements, and the use of glass walls as those stability elements. When I started working in glass, it was all about the glass as a very much a secondary element, just a cladding thing bolted on t onto a structure, in my case. And we'll, we'll sort of explore from that point, f point forward. And we're just going to structure it into uh, uh, a little bit about the, the, the introduction to where we are now and a bit of the, bit of the history. And then Peter's going to talk in some more detail about calculation methods, some of the things that we've learned through that journey uh, about the calculations, uh, the construction methods, and just con conclude it with uh, where are we, where might, where might we go next. So to, uh, to start back in the, the, the history, um, this, this was a, 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 an artwork and a skylight conceived by Ron Arad in about 1998. And it's, uh, it was at uh, Canary Wharf in London, and it's over the intersection of two shopping malls. And there's a there's a hole in the concrete slab, and the idea was that there was a skylight uh, down into the um, to illuminate the shopping mall below. And the re the request was, could we stand this? Uh, it's about 13 meter diameter uh, fiberglass saucer. Could we stand it on? the seven meter glass um, cylinder at the bottom. And then there's a, there's a hole underneath. And I'd, my, kind of, my first reaction was, no, of course you can't. And then I'm thinking, well, it depends how good your budget is, really, doesn't it? Um, and they had, a, they, had a good, they had a good budget for this at the time. And, and it also depended on a bit of technology, which we'll, we'll come to in a moment. But the, the concept is that the glass cylinder is supported on the, on the glass panels, and, uh, the and then there's a, there's a hole that it's protecting. So one of the things we've got to do is stop people crashing through the glass and going down the hole. We have to hold the cylinder up. We have to hold it down against the wind load. You see how asymmetric it is. There was a sort of big overturning load on it, an uplift load, way more than it's... It weighed about six tons. And... Um, we had, to, we had to make sure that it was, it was going to be a safe kind of structure. And that new bit of technology was that a, a little independent company in, in the East Midlands in, in England had built, designed and built their own bending and toughening furnace, which they claimed was accurate enough that they could bend and toughen two layers of 19 mil glass accurately enough they could laminate them together. And that was... For me, that was, that was a really new thing in, in, in 98. 
Um, so that's what we based it on. So we were then designing this glass wall based on two meter wide panels, up to two meters tall, bolts in the corners, one layer of the glass carrying the load through a, uh, a ball joint fitting. And the thing that really bothered me was how was I going to distribute the load from this really stiff um, flying saucer it, and down into the, into the concrete slab. Because the concrete slab that the landscaping's on is really quite flexible. And my mate, the structural engineer, said, well, it's going to creep and keep moving. So don't assume it's going to stay in shape. So we picked three points on the concrete ring and, and put a little pivot bracket, balanced a thing like a seesaw on each of those brackets. So we know the three loads would be, would, would be predictable. Put a seesaw on there, so these two loads would be the same. But then we needed to divide it not into two panels per third, we needed to divide it into three groups of four panels. So there's another balance bar on the end of each of those. And then to connect the panel, onto each of those little seesaws on seesaws, there were further seesaw beams. So, it, so each bolt at the bottom of a glass panel had a totally predictable, mechanically predictable load. And so kind of hidden in that detail, there is, there's all this machinery. So it, it, so, and the panels are bolted to the shell, so they're kind of cantilevering down. So the shear load is kind of taken by this massive stiffness of the fiberglass shell and everything else is, is kind of quite mobile to make it predictable. And it survived, it survived many years, uh, and then they took it down to create a bit more exhibition space, so it, it, it disappeared about a, week, a year ago. So that one's, that one's no longer around. Uh, wrong button. There you go. Uh, about 10 years later, uh, Eric Parry, architects, designed uh, a new entrance to the crypt at St. Martin in the Fields, just off uh, Trafalgar Square in London. This has got a much heavier roof. This is about uh, 13 tons stainless steel roof, uh, comparatively a little bit more flexible, <clears throat> um, a really solid, solid concrete base, and nothing stabilizing. Inside, there's a, there's a lift shaft, which isn't connected to the roof. You might see here, whoop, ah, wrong button. Let's go back one. You might hit, sit here what looks like a column is actually just a downpipe. It's a rainwater downpipe. That's the only thing that goes from top to bottom. So the, the, the roof stands on these glass panels. And so they, they were deliberately annealed glass. In fact, three, layer, three layers of glass bent, bent together and laminated. And the roof is heavy enough so there's no wind uplift. So this is this one, no bolts. Anneal glass, so if it gets vandalized, it's not rewarding, it's just dull, so, and, and, and you don't see too much damage. Um, really nice, you know, sort of good visual quality here. Here's one that Peter actually designed before he joined us. Uh, and and, and uh, I did a peer review on, this is the Manchester Library link in, uh, in, in Manchester. Uh, and here the glass is about eight, eight metres tall. Seven. seven. Um, again, a steel roof, and there's like more like 30 tonnes of roof here. Again, enough to dead load it all downwards. Um, and it's standing in shoes at the bottom. But, but now, you know, from the little Ron Arad sculpture where we had a two metre edge was the longest, 90 mil fat glass, nobody cared about the buckling. That was not relevant. By the time we're getting through St. Martin in the fields and we get to this one, the edges and looking at the, the buckling in these edges, which are taking shear and compression together, are starting to get interesting. And then this two lines, um, David, David Chipper, Chipperfield installation for London Design Festival a few years ago that our colleague Felix Weber designed. Um, using uh, laminated glass with the CIFAR mesh in it, built by our friends Bella Park, who I think are in the, in the room. Hello. Um, this um, had these orthogonal fins cantilevering from the ground in two different directions, but to get the stability, you've got to link them together by the roof. So that question mark pattern on the roof, those glass panels connect the groups 
Uh, uh, I've done it again. Connect, say, this group of, of fins with this group, and with this group, and with this group. But the stability is achieved by the kind of bending and the connection of these panels in the roof to keep it all to kind of lock together. And this had to be assembled very quickly, a very short time on site of a couple of days, really. So the connections are silicone bonded and then bolted together. Um, then, a few years later, much more recently, we found ourselves working with uh, Foster and Partners, particularly our colleague Felix was, was there regularly, looking at another example of this floating roof, a big sort of floating roof flying saucer thing. Glass wall underneath, it's about 40 meters diameter, and it was on minimal columns because it, they really didn't want to see any columns. And the seismic load on it would make the roof sway backwards and forwards. We say sort of span over height over 100, so you've got an 80 mil movement. We want to put these eight, eight meter tall glass walls in, minimum detail. There's loads of movement requirement now to follow this roof. And it pretty soon became apparent that actually the, the structurally simpler way to do it was to stand the roof on the glass, get rid of the columns. The glass cylinder, the big glass cylinder, would then be stiffer, and all the movement think requirements would come down. We just needed to make sure the roof was light, because the seismic load was, was dominated by the mass of the roof. So it's kind of another fiber composite roof, like the, like the Ron, Ron Arad thing, to make it very light. I can't show you any more, I can't show you any detail of that actual, actual job, so. Um, the reason to tell that story is it, it, it's kind of progression from the little, the little blue, big blue one through the uh, St. Martin in the Fields, Manchester, and the scale was a huge difference in scale. But we were only kind of confident to say, you know what, you could consider taking out the columns because of having gone through these other steps, I thought, yeah, we think we can, we can, we can figure out how to, how to do that. And Peter was saying, well, like, that, that didn't seem to take very long. It felt like it's taken, you know, it's taken a couple of decades, in a sense, to make that progress. In comparison with the time it took to develop big cathedrals, which was hundreds of years, maybe, maybe we're, we're moving faster as an industry now. And I, I, I put a lot of that down to, to come into GBD exchanging ideas, sharing, sharing experiences, and in this, in, in this kind of uh, forum, sharing, uh, share, sharing that experience and being able to build up the confidence uh, among our, all of us that, w that we can do these sort of things. Uh, most, most recently, uh, this glass wall is not supporting the roof, I must admit, but the, 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 the learning about the stability of the edges and so on enables us to do this one. Uh, which has got, uh, it's basically folded plate, a folded plate wall, all of double glazed units. There aren't any real fins. The double glazed units are the fins for the adjacent panel. And uh, it's standing on, on, on the floor. But that's, that's all part of this kind of progression. So Peter, would you like to take over and, and tell us a little bit about the details and Thank you, how you made some of these bits work? Yeah. So you get you left me eleven minutes, so we will go Sorry. to do <laughs> this very fast. Uh, so obviously, it's taking some of the engineering leap to make that uh, magic happen, right? And uh, obviously, first thing when we have all those projects, we need to consider something uh, how these panels are manufactured. And usually, in the buckling case, the initial imperfections are quite important. If we consider the typical imperfections of, say, uh, L over 300. In the smaller size of a three meter window, it is nine millimeters, which is kind of acceptable. However, when you upscaling this to nine, ten, whatever, it, it's very quickly apparent that if you go with the, what is written in the code in the, uh, right now, it will be very tricky and very difficult, and it will be very visual, and you have a misalignment joints and so on. 
So while maybe the codes will require us, and we will maybe discuss this later, to still consider those high imperfections, in real life, project specification will definitely ask for, for tighter tolerances. Um, in addition to this, obviously, it's not just the, the bow, it is inclination as well, what needs to be considered, P delta delta assumptions. Then in, in addition to imperfections, usually this is a out, panels are working as a facade element, there will be a out of plane loading, there will be a wind, there will be a seismic, and usually this is driven by the deflection limit, because again, we don't want anything to deflect too much. Um, and especially if these are DGU units, I think probably very rarely, maybe somewhere obscure in, a, in Bangkok or, or where you can, you will do laminated glass, but generally speaking, it is DGUs. It, is, uh, it, it needs to be, right? I think we need to be sustainable and we need to think uh, for, for our future. So then the spacer bars will, will probably buckle and they will create issues. So. Obviously, well, there is two types of loading. The first one will be the compression only, uh, what, what is quite simple. However, uh, somehow we need to make our building stable in the horizontal direction as well. So therefore, we will need to consider the shear load to be transferred down to the ground as well. And uh, we can consider some of the buildings having a separate uh, dead load or gravity system and stability system. However, in some cases, it's probably con uh, you, it's, it's usual that we will combine those, uh, those elements together in one. So we look into this, obviously, a quick model of how, say, six by three panel, keep it convenient, keep it easy, keep it simple, because obviously you can go for 15 by three, but I think that's probably a little bit expensive. But you can achieve quite a lot with six meters uh, elements, and it's quite impressive as well, and it's relatively achievable and, and, and cheap to some extent. So obviously, um, how this will behave if you apply the shear load, how this will behave, typical oil layer buckling of the panel. Uh, you, you, can, you can calculate what is the buckling curve, uh, what the, the panel will take, roughly speaking, 200 kilonewtons in compression, well, how this will behave when this is combined. There are initial imperfections in it. Um, then I think we are working together uh, with others uh, to, to develop this structural code. There are good sets of uh, questions. When you put all these numbers into one, you will, you will conclude that the, uh, the panel can take 192 kilonewtons, what is very good at, uh, very good correlation to, to, the, to, the, uh, to the numerical models. Uh, and then when you have this numerical model, you can then ex ex expand and, and look into what will be the in imperfections um, uh, tolerance. So we look into what is the uh, uh, imperfections of, say, 1 to 500, 1 to f uh, 250, 1 to 100. What will be the influence of the uh, shear modulus of the interlayer, if this is a long term or short term? And you can see, you can very quickly find out what is the safe-ish uh, load, what the panels can, uh, can transfer. So if you do all those models, you will find out what will, be the, what will be the reaction forces, what you need to transfer. And doing this in volumetric elements with all these interlayers and so on, you will probably very quickly find out that there are some some, some, how you support the panel, and I think because of the additional bending that is introduced due to the buckling, you see that there are some eccentricities, and that, that was keeping us quite busy, and we look into this into more detail. So we love uh, curved glass, all of us, it looks sexy, it looks good, so we look into a very quick study of how those panels, how is the, the stiffness, uh, geometrical stiffness of the curved panel, how this is influencing the buckling. Again, very quick numerical study, parametric study of from flat panel to, to radius uh, of curvature of six meters or something. Um, and I think plotting this on the graph, the, the, the very nice uh, von Karman uh, uh, thin plate uh, buckling curve for flat panel. But if you start to introduce little curvature, you find out very quickly that it is edge instability and, and sharp uh, buckling of, of our edge. So it is a local instability problem rather than a global buckling case. So looking at the connections, obviously what you notice there is that we usually will be using laminated glass, while we know that there are some challenges with uh, recycling, recycling and uh, and so on, what we need to overcome, but generally speaking, we will not do anything in monolithic glass. I, I hope so. <laughs> um, there will be some edge steps. Obviously, we will need to, uh, in, in the specifications, somehow manage that. 
and usually people are doing it. But in the case we just looked at what will be kind of like if you model it explicitly, what are the, the dis differences of the different the small spring stiffnesses of, of the healthy material um, and how this influences the loans transfer. The load is applied directly, perfectly in, into the system. However, when you start to think about that you may have some eccentricities in the system, uh, this will start to introduce uh, P-delta effects on the support. Uh, it will start to bend and back, uh, bend the, the panel, and also load distribution is, is starting to be quite tricky. So I think careful with the detailing. Uh, similar actions when you have a very thick laminate, say five twelves and so on, we've been uh, introduced to the idea of 16 twelves earlier today. So I think then you will need to think about uh, how these pins, how s the stiffness of the pins, how is the pin buckling, how, how is the pin bending, how is the, what, what is the compression zones in the, in, into glass, because you can probably find out that it's not that linear and it's not just simply force divided by area. In, uh, in obviously, as Graham mentioned earlier, the, his, his, his project in, uh, in London, the roofs are probably not that stiff. Maybe they have a different load paths. The load will be never equally distributed across many elements, so you need to consider that, as well as our supporting structures, they are not stiff. So there will be some differences, and your, and your panels will always see a different loading conditions. So obviously, if, we're doing so, if, we, if this is a part of the primary structure, uh, the consequence of the failure is a little bit different from a consequence of failure of a facade panel or a bus stop uh, station. So I think we looked into this concept um, uh, earlier this, this year where we wanted to build this 10 meter drum. Uh, the concept was done on the basis that uh, let's use a little bit of maybe thin glass, maybe a little, use a little bit of curvature. Obviously, this needs to be a triple insulated panel. We are in London, uh, why not? Uh, so, looking into the details, how we may consider this to, to happen. Um, obviously, the detail on the top, some of the details from the bottom from different projects. Um, so, these are the most important aspects of, of the job. I got three minutes <laughs> <laughs> oh, to, go, to go through the construction. So probably that will be super fast, and actually what we need to design, we can design whatever you want to us to design, or whatever architects and clients want us to design, but ev essentially, eventually, we'll need to speak to the contractors. We will need to be sure that whatever we're designing is, is constructible, there is possibility of fabrication, and there is a safe way of installation of those, of those components. And eventually, edge steps and all, all these other things needs to be considered, it needs to be known to the manufacturer and, and you know we are asking manufacturers to tighten their tolerances not because uh, we want or, or we, we, we like because there are some structural aspects of it and that's I think it to be kept, kept in the mind that if you're building something that is uh, of importance uh, the, the specifications are, are, are tight and then obviously you need to somehow install it and I think as I said if you think about how much 12 millimeter eccentricity in the connection is changing the, the structural behavior and load transfer in the detail, uh, then I think you need to think twice because 12 millimeter of tolerance is not that uh, bad. You may detail it with some ball joints and whatever, but I think there will be always eccentricity in the system. And if you have that, then you have a problem. So this is uh, one of the pictures we should not uh, show, I think. So Just to <laughs> illustrate that over a range of sizes, you know, this, if you've got a big enough crane, you can still lift the, the fiberglass roof on there, or yeah. can't fiber composite roof on. So, and then I think detailing and how you pack all those elements, how you transfer all the loads, uh, I think it's key and important. That's maybe the old school method of using an island, an island pad. Uh, but obviously Hilti and the resins are probably the way uh, how we're doing this now. So I will I get one minute. So <laughs> I think what, what, what we spoke about today is that this was driven by the, by the, tech, by, by the generation of high-tech architecture. They, they had a vision and we needed to somehow adapt as engineers uh, for, to this, uh, to support that vision. Uh, we we managed to develop our analysis techniques and our calculations and our understanding of structural behavior 
quite good, right? Quite well. We, we kind of like all of us knows how to use the fine element. We all know. Uh, we, we tested quite a lot of, of those structures. So we have a fair understanding and therefore probably we, we ended up where we ended up building what we're building. Uh, but also I think I need to give a credit to our contractors. They managed to master the glass manufacturing and fabrication. And I think this is the only way how, why this all happened, mm. I think honestly. Um, so there are key considerations that are written in the paper, so we will not go through that. Um, what we want to point out that we ended up uh, doing what we're doing, but I think we're still lacking a little bit on the monitoring of the structural behavior. I think it is important to, to understand how this works. Uh, if our calculations are correct. Maybe we did some testing, but I think we still don't know if, uh, if our assumptions are, are valid. So I think that's something what I would like to really focus our, our if we can, if the clients are allowing us to monitor uh, what we built, that will be that will be perfect. So and then I think th there are some some developments in the future. I think if we're building in seismic zones, uh, we will definitely have some dissipation systems. Obviously, glass cannot take any uh, any load. I think so far we manage with a simple systems as um, as dissipate as a steel plate in bending which dissipates the energy. It's as simple as that. We managed so far with, with those kind of uh, simple constructions. Perhaps if we're lucky, we, we manage to do some springs. Uh, but uh, I, I think we need to look what is happening in the other constructions. And you know, in bridges, we're using those dumpers, uh, I think for 20 years. I think we're just discussing with, uh, with Graham that in uh, Kensai Airport in Osaka, yes. The, the, the building is from 89, the building is on built on the, on, on the man-made island and, and the entire airport is supported on a hydraulic jacks because the, uh, the soil was deforming about 600, it, it was predicted that the soil will deform as, uh, around 600 millimeters. So the building, the airport was supported on those jacks and the jacks are always uh, pushing uh, down to, to, to control those deformations. So. Again, one, my, one, one of last what I want to say is that, say, in the car industry, all those no, new Mercedes and high performance cars, they have active system. Each wheel is orientated. If you turn right, if, if, the, if, the, if the wheel um, realizes that it's not in contact with the surface or so, the, the suspension is hardening and it's controlling and it's turning differently from, from other wheels. So this is the, the, the active systems are, are something what we would like to incorporate in the, into our designs to make sure that uh, we know what we're doing. Sorry to bank <laughs> over time. Thank, Thank you for the deadline to work. Hi there. Did you like what you just saw? If you did, why don't you like the video? Drop us a comment below and share the video as well since GPD is all about sharing and to receive more videos in future subscribe to this channel and don't forget to click the bell icon. Ciao!